explain what ecocide is? Ecocide is the mass damage, destruction to or loss of ecosystems. I proposed it into the United Nations as an international crime to stand alongside other international crimes such as genocide. Amazingly, it isn't already a crime, and yet during wartime we do have an international crime that closes the door to mass damage and destruction. I believe that we need to do the same during peacetime so that we can make it a crime, an international crime against peace for all time. Why is it needed? It's very much needed because at the moment we have normalised mass damage and destruction on a daily basis, in particular corporate ecocide. What we're looking at is, is a system that has been created as a result of law where we put profit first. It, it is the law in virtually every country that chief executives and directors maximise their profits to their shareholders. Now, I'm not against profit, but I am making a stand against profit that arises out of mass damage and destruction. And extractive industry causes an enormous amount of damage and destruction in the pursuit of profit. What I'm wanting to do is close the door to that damage and destruction uh, and facilitate a way where we actually encourage and prioritise innovation in a very different direction, how we discover how to create new industries that, that can actually be benign and most importantly prioritise putting people and planet first rather than profit first. Profit will flow uh, from business all the same, it's just that we will no longer allow business that causes mass damage and destruction. A very good example is unconventional tar extraction, for instance, in the Athabasca tar sands. What we have there is enormous damage and destruction for very short-term gain in terms of energy, when we have other solutions that under law of ecocide would be preferred, for instance, renewable energy. Um, how will it benefit humans as well as the Earth? An international law of ecocide will benefit humans by creating a legislative framework that ensures that we prioritise non-destruction of the earth. Now, the reason why that's so important is that destroy the earth that we walk on and what happens is we destroy our ability to peacefully enjoy the very earth that we live on. We're recognising that we're at tipping points of ecosystem collapse and planetary boundaries and at the moment, a lot of this is occurring as a result of corporate ecocide. So by closing the door to that, what we will allow to flourish is far more resilient economies and businesses built on the premise of non-destructive principles. Now that's absolutely crucial to the health and well-being of humanity, because when we look after the health and well-being of the planet, then we in turn are able to live in peaceful enjoyment. There is a direct correlation between how we as humans are able to function on this earth when we look at the actual functioning of the earth itself. Destroy the earth, we destroy our ability to live here in peace. Do I think humanity has an apartheid with nature? Yes, I do. Or certainly Western civilization has. Uh, I think the so-called developed world has created an enormous disconnect with nature and law has played its part in doing this. Of course, when we set up laws that maximise profits and put profit as, as our number one priority in business, we didn't realise at the time when we were doing that that what we were doing was actually creating this level of disconnect between ourselves and nature uh, as a being, a living being. And in fact, what we've done is we've created a system that prioritizes ownership, and that's by using property laws and contract, law of contract. So when we end up with a system that's predominantly based on I own, rather than we owe a legal duty of care, then what happens is we become incredibly disconnected from taking responsibility for the earth itself. So this is really about how we realign and, and shift the way we perceive the earth and our relationship with the earth. 
At the moment, it's the disconnect, the lack of the relationship that's causing the problem. But once we understand that there is a, an inherent interconnectedness to life, that we are interdependent on the functioning of the Earth as an ecosystem, then we can start looking at our relationship within trusteeship principles rather than ownership principles. And of course, trusteeship principles means that we look longer term. We look to the benefit of other beings, not just human beings, but all inhabitants of the Earth. And when we do that, we start to look far longer term. We look to seven generations hence, rather than just how we maximize our profits within the next quarterly or annual return. Do you believe in the Gaia theory? And is it a spiritual as well as a scientific understanding? For me, the Gaia theory is very much a spiritual as well as a, a practical and scientific understanding of our relationship with the Earth. It's, it's the, the inherent understanding of the Earth as a living being. And that, for me, has a very important spiritual dimension. I, for me, it transcends religion uh, or, or specific faiths or, or belief systems. This is something that I think is, is, is a universal truth, a higher truth, if you like. It's, it's nature's own higher truths, nature's laws. And what we're doing really here is trying to seek a greater understanding of natural law. And I think Gaia theory really helps us to understand that there is something bigger than just us on this planet. And for me, that is about understanding that life itself is sacred of all beings, not just human beings, but all beings. When we put life itself at the center of what we're doing, then our attitude shifts fundamentally. Uh -oh, wait. In fact, Tristan, let's move on. You know, yeah, we'll just keep on moving on. I mean, he'll cuss and use what he wants. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on those, on those people who cheerfully say in agreement with the positive? What are your thoughts on those people who cheerfully say in agreement with the prospect of environmental and social societal collapse? Well, if it won't happen in my lifetime, as if that makes it okay, forgetting their children stand beside them. Yeah. There's sometimes a response to to engaging on environmental issues where people turn around and say, well, you know, it's, it's not going to happen in my lifetime, so why should I care? Well, that's a car. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that for me. Because that, that started really well. Okay, yeah. So, so can yeah. I answer, answer the question? Can yeah. Some people sometimes say in response to uh, caring for the environment, well, why should I care? It's, you know, we're not going to have e ecological collapse in my lifetime, so why should I bother engaging in this? Well, for me, I think it's actually very important that we do engage in this here and now, because it is actually playing out in our lifetime. But also, it's not for us to sidestep our responsibilities. Once we have the knowledge that what we are doing is damaging and destructive, then it's not for us to turn the blind eye. We now know that what we're doing is a system that doesn't work. And we now know that there are systems that we can put in place to stop that, to heal the harm that's been done, and to ensure that we create a new path that takes us into a far better place. So this is not so much about what's in it for me in the here and now, this is about What's for the best, for the greater good of just, not just humankind, but all kinds? And the beauty is, is that we actually do have the tools that we need to create that beautiful new future that we all want. So this is about each and every single one of us standing up and taking responsibility and standing up and becoming participants and co-creators in that new world. And part of that is about the facilitation of the creation of new laws to help us bridge that gap to get us there. Right, but now I'll uh, move in and I'll see you on the other side. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How do we ensure that ecocide and earth rights don't lead to eco-dictatorship and eco-fascism? 
this is, this is really about actually the devil in the detail. So what this comes down to is how we define mass damage and destruction. Uh, in my proposal to the United Nations, what I've set out is that we have a framework where we look at, at an international level, where we close the door to mass damage and destruction that is either 200 kilometers or more in size, uh, impacts a season or more, or, or um, it's severe, either severity of impact on human or natural or economic resources. It can be any one of those three. Now, the reason that I've used that proposal is that, in fact, that's what we use during wartime as our parameters. So this is an existing test, if you will, that's already at play and in use. I, it's not about you know, standing on an ant and therefore we've got an ecocide, absolutely not. But it's about putting in place something that closes the door to mass damage and destruction, which then closes the door to the financing of mass damage and destruction and closes the door to policy at a government, governmental level supporting mass damage and destruction. That'll have a knock-on impact on many ecocides, if you will, because what'll happen is that we'll start reframing our considerations as to whether or not we proceed with certain activity within the context of, for instance, should we uh, destroy that parkland to build a supermarket? Is that going to destroy an ecosystem? Is it not more beneficial that we retain the ecosystem or replace it with uh, an equivalent elsewhere? The premise that shifted here is our understanding that it should be the exception to cause damage and destruction and only when we do that we can replace it. But it's to be used in a constructive manner. At the end of the day, stepping on an ant is never going to constitute a crime of ecocide. <laughs> I think that the degradation, the degradation of outer environment is a reflection of our inner <coughs> psychological or spiritual environment. Yes, the, the degradation. Hold on, uh, yeah. that was my whole question. Um, let me start again. Yeah. Do you think the degradation of outer environment is a reflection of our inner psychological or spiritual environment? Should we be addressing the degradation of our outer, in, of our inner environment as much as the outer? Should we be addressing the inner? degradation as much as the outer degradation, yes, absolutely. And are they reflections of each other? Yes, these are reflections of each other. I, after all, what happens within us is a microcosm of what's happening in the macrocosm of the, of the world. The right not to be polluted applies equally to my own body as it does to the earth. The right to exist, the right to be, I, the right not to be destroyed the freedom to enjoy life and peaceful enjoyment applies equally to myself as it does to the earth. But it's also, it's deeper than that. In fact, this is about how we spiritually engage with our relationship with the earth. And when we do see it as a relationship, then something fundamentally shifts within us because we do start to take responsibility, we do start to care and that, that is something that comes from the heart, not, not just from the head. So this is really about how we reframe our understanding of ourselves and actually how we face our shadow self and give it name. Only when that happens does the healing begin. Just as we do it in the outer world when we can turn around and say that mass damage and destruction has a name and it's ecocide. Only when we give it name, we create those laws, can the healing really begin? Can we go in there and actually put restoration and restorative justice into place? And that, that, that's, that applies in our lives too. When we actually face whatever it is that is our shadow self and give it name, that's when our own inner healing begins. So really what we do and how we play out in our own lives is a reflection on a micro level of what we are trying to do and apply here on a micro level. Great. Okay, I think we've got like one more or two more questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, one more question. Wealth that is far greater than that can, ever, that can ever be repaid with the Earth's resources and environmental health. Do you think we need a modern day jubilee? And what do you think a new economic model would look like? <laughs> I'm not too sure what he means by modern day jubilee. So we'll just go to the, the new economic model. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
what would a new economic model look like? Well, the beauty is, is that I don't think we're that far away from it. All, it. all it requires is a true understanding of the word economics. The word economics, its etymological root, is two ancient Greek words, oikos and nomos. Oikos means habitat or home, and nomos is management. So this is about good household management. And if we apply that to the earth, then we see it's not about money, it's about how we manage to look after our home. So a new economic paradigm puts the interests of people and planet first. And when we do that, what we will do is build a very resilient economy, what's sometimes referred to as the green economy. But it's an economy that really understands that it is the sacredness of life that lies at the heart of all of this. It's what I would call sacred economics. That's what we're really moving towards. And I genuinely believe that we will do this. Ecocide is a law that will help facilitate sacred economics, uh, a new world that flourishes on a different economic system where good household management of our home, our earth, for people and planet comes first. Yeah. <laughs> We've got it. Okay.